It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Eric Qualman, and we're going to be discussing his new book, The Focus Project, The Not-So-Simple Art of Doing Less. Eric, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. No, thanks for having me and thanks for your listeners and can't wait to talk a little bit about focus. And you mentioned shiny objects, so we might get into if you're a squirrel or not. We'll see if you are a squirrel. Oh, oh yes. I definitely want to talk about the spirit animals. I think that's uh, uh, something that's going to be extremely helpful to all of my listeners. Uh, but, you know, Eric, I've been reading your books for years. I've been a big fan of your work, but I know inevitably there are going to be people in my audience who are meeting you for the first time today. So let's kick this off by having you share a bit of the Eric Qualman origin story for somebody meeting you for the first time. Tell us about your special abilities, your superpowers. What do we need to know about you? No, I love it. I love that you mentioned superpowers. So my name's Eric Qualman. So if you take my first initial last name, it's Equal Man. So some of you might know me better as Equal Man. Uh, thank you, parents, for naming me that. And, you know, I grew up in the Midwest. And then I got into digital right out of college just by happenstance. So I've been in the digital space for 27 years. Uh, my first book, and I was on the digital side, like I worked at Yahoo back when they were kind of the Facebook of the day. And then I was ahead of market at Travel Zoo. So we took that company from private to public and it was a top performing stock on a NASDAQ. So my whole career has been digital based, but I'm also a big fan of humans. So I'm really more Flintstones and Jetsons. But what I talk about and write about is really the marriage of those two. And my first book was called Social Nomics, which was written 11 years ago. And it's basically, it's hard to fathom now. Because at the time, MySpace was bigger than Facebook when I'm writing this book. People didn't, Facebook was just at Harvard. And I was trying to tell people, look, this big thing's coming and how it's going to change the world. Not only who we elect as presidents of countries, but how do we communicate with each other and how do we sell products? So social media, that's what that book was about. Social economics, how it's going to change the way we live and do business. So right place, right time. And then fast forward a decade. And now I've written a book called The Focus Project, which is basically an anti-venom to that book. Because that book was, hey, get on these platforms. And then all of a sudden I started seeing people just being turned into zombies with their phones. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys went too far in. Um, it's kind of like the 80s show for anyone that remembers like the, the greatest American hero. He wasn't given the instruction book for this super suit that he was given to be a superhero. And so it's like, okay, guys, this is what we need to do. Let's get in the middle. Flintstones, Jetsons. Here's the focus project. Yeah, I always think of the, the Spider-Man line, with great power comes great responsibility. And, and there is something to that in terms of marketing and messaging and communicating with audiences. If you know the sociology, the psychology, and, and the way you can trigger people, it's a very powerful, uh, powerful force to yield. But there is a dark side to it. So when, when we have that ability and power, we do need to be responsible citizens of the internet because... Uh, well, like, like you said, people are just literally addicted to the dopamine hits from their phones and, and, and their devices. And there's a whole world of actual people in our homes, in our workplaces, where we could be in real relationships, having real conversations, or we could just be staring at Facebook and doing email all day, which is, I think, where, what a lot of us have tended to default towards. Uh, but we're going to change that today because we're going to talk about your new book that will help people get away uh, from the places that uh, suck up all their time, I, I guess you might say. Um, but in my introduction, I talk about shiny objects. I, I would consider your glasses a shiny object. I'm a guy who travels, goes to lots of events, and I do crazy things to stand out in a crowd because it opens up a lot of conversation. I'm curious for you, um, is it a branding device? Is it to get people, like, what was the reason for going uh, with glasses like that? Because I'm going to guess people notice them and, and obviously will say something. Yeah, no, interesting enough is that things happen in life for you, not to you. And this is a case of that. It's exactly what happened is a magazine wanted to do a photo shoot and they said, hey, we want to have some fun with this cover. Do you mind if you give you some Clark Kent like glasses since you have a name Equal Man? It sounds like a superhero. And at this point in time, just that's just my website, Equal Man. And I go, yeah, yeah, we can do that. And they go, well, it's our St. Patrick's Day issue. Do you mind if they're green? I go, let's, let's rock them. And they bring them out. I'm like, whoa, those are really bright. And I really didn't think much of it. And then I flew to Kenya a couple of weeks later and before I, to speak, I was going to give a keynote speech. And then the night before, I was going to adopt a baby cheetah from a rescue shelter, not to take home, but just to help the local area. You know, my wife would kill me if I brought a cheetah home. But on the ride over 
to the shelter, the lady that I was with said, Hey, you know, the Olympic sprinter, Usain Bolt was here a couple of days ago and he adopted from the same litter that you're going to adopt from. Do you mind if we film you? Cause we're going to marry this film footage together and just raise money for the shelter. And I go, yeah, that sounds like a wonderful idea. And then she pauses and looks at me and goes, but obviously when we're filming, we want to make sure you're wearing your green glasses. And I kind of look back at her and I go, Oh, I don't wear those all the time. I'd look like an idiot walking around wearing green glasses all the time. And then the look on her face, I never want to see that look again. So it, it kind of just something happened for me. It's like, all right, I'm going to be rocking these green glasses. And it's not something that was easy because we actually lost speaking deals because of it. Because at the time, companies go, we don't want, we want something serious. Like we want to talk about digital and digital transformation. We wear suits. We, we were bank. We got to, we don't want that guy. And so Stepping into your story is often the hardest thing to do, but it's the best place to live long-term. So short-term, it's going to be uncomfortable to actually step into your story, but long-term, it's the greatest place to live. And it's the best thing that's happened for me. So as you mentioned, all of a sudden it becomes a marketing device. And I know this, like I'm a marketer. So at the back of my mind, I go, that could probably help, but I'm also from the Midwest. So I kind of had the devil and the angel going, you can't wear green glasses. That's like me, 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 look at me. And then the angels go, no, but it's good for branding. And people think that's what you look like. So you got to do it. And ultimately, I decided I got to step into discomfort because my whole thing is to have fun and help people. So entertain, educate, and empower people. And so I go, these are going to help empower that one other person, whether that person's 18 or 80. I've got to do it. Whether I like it or not, we're going to rock these green glasses. And then the ride since then has been amazing. We actually now produce like thousands of green glasses because I'll go to a conference and they go, we want everyone in the audience to have these green glasses. We want our logo on them. And so it's been a wild ride. And I tell you that story and thanks for being patient with it. Not because my cheetah is much faster than Usain Bolt's cheetah, which is true. But I tell that story because I really do believe we're all living the same movie. We're just different actresses and actresses. So I hope that what you take from that story is that you step fully into your story and it will be uncomfortable, but it's the most comfortable place you can live. I'm wearing green glasses without lenses. I've been poked in the eye twice at book signings because people come up and go, there's no lenses in there. And before they realize what they're doing, they're kind of poking me in the eye. Fortunately, I'm tall, so usually I can avoid it. But when I'm sitting down signing books, sometimes I'm not quick enough. So anyways, it's, it's been a fun ride with the green glasses. Well, what's interesting to me about that is um, I always caution authors, especially when they're starting out, um, to really portray who they really are online. Like, be be true to yourself. Um, you know, be be who you are uh, with how you portray yourself on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram in your podcast. Because when you go out amongst the populace, people are going to expect that you're going to be that person. And so I, I find it really fascinating that uh, somebody saw you with those glasses and they expected that that was who you were, that you just wore those all the time because that was a, a normal thing. Because people... For better or worse, they develop relationships with us through our podcasts and all the different ways they consume our contents, our, our, our books, our audiobooks, whatever it may be. And when we are out of character from their expectation, it's kind of like, obviously it was jarring for that lady that you're like, well, I don't wear those all the time. And she was like, well, clearly that must be the, the cool thing you do because it's your superhero-like glasses. So very, very fascinating. So yes, uh, my takeaway for that is uh, be transparent, be who you are. Because then you don't have to try to live 17 different lives. It's a lot simpler if you just be who you are. Then you can be uh, normal in yourself in uh, all the spheres that you have influence. Um, well, let's transition now into uh, the story behind the book. You, you kind of open the book with uh, a, kind of a, a s series of challenges that we can relate to in terms of, uh, at least I can, uh, being up late at night, uh, you know, holidays, weekends, uh, working into the wee hours of the morning, dealing with client issues. And, um, you know, that can consume all of our time. So uh, tell us about kind of that, that Christmas season that eventually would result in this focus project journey getting started. And so, yeah, it all started a lot with a Christmas item because it was the, it was the night before Christmas. And I got, and I mean, I won't go too much into depth because my kids are still young. So I don't want to give away the spoiler alert on some of the stuff if they happen to be listening to this, but there was at two, three in the morning, a client had literally sent the subject line. So just for you listeners, we actually own an animation studio. So we we're working on animation for them and helping them with some of their social stuff, but primarily with animation. And it was, you know, kill the contract was the subject line. 
And what we do is a lot of times we like, you have to do it for six months because it's going to be painful the first three months. You got to just make it through this and then I'll, I'll be good. But short story is that you've get this, I get this on Christmas Eve. I'm sitting there assembling stuff. Ho, ho, ho. For those that know. And, and all the dads can relate. That, so then I'm like, oh my gosh. And then I just realized, what am I doing? And then just kind of, it's that movie moment where it's just flashing back to the last 10 years and going, where is my focus? Like, where is that focus? Why do I feel like my hair is on fire? And this is Christmas Eve. Why am I dealing with this? Why is my hair on fire at the end of every day? And here I am, I, I own the company. Like, why shouldn't it be? That's why I own the company. And then also I go, am I the only one wrestling with this? And then, so I went on a journey the next couple of months, just having my antenna up and whether it was a school teacher, whether it was, a stay at home mom or dad, or whether it was, you know, a pastor, or whether it was a CEO or a small business owner, they all had the same issue. And the misnomer is it's like the it's time famine, but it's really an energy famine. And I'll get in that in a little second. But it's really just like, where's our focus. And so I go, I want to focus on the big things, not the busy things. And the more I talk to people, people are like nodding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was sitting there listening. I talked to these people, like their last name's Hershey or the last name Mars. They like, they own the company, right? They own the company and they're wrestling with the same thing. But I ask them, well, you're successful. Why are you successful? And they go, focus. They go, I'm a little better focusing than most. And I go, all right, what are you, what are you challenged with? They're like staying focused. And so I go, okay, let me go down a path for a year, just doing the, looking at the institutional research, like reading essentialism, you know, the Stoics, all these time management books and taking that research and then testing it. I was going to be the guinea pig. What worked for me and what didn't work? Uh, and then just personalize that in a book, in a project so that people could look at it and see it through the lines of so, the, the eyes of someone they can identify with. And then they go, okay, that worked for him, didn't work for me. That, that works for him, that works for me too. And so that's the whole genesis of the book and the project. Uh, I was curious, you, you went kind of Tim Ferriss focused, you know, like experimenting on yourself. Um, did you have to wrestle with that? Because some authors would gravitate towards finding other people that could partner with them to work out these processes. But you went on a year long journey, uh, really experimenting on yourself. W was that difficult? Or were you just all in from the start? It was the biggest challenge, especially when you convert that to a book. And I talk about this up front. And, and I'll say the audible version. Thanks for listening to it as I talk about in the audible version is that most of my books to date, all of my books to date have been basically, I do the research and then here's the take on it, or just, this is my opinion on what the future is going to look like. So it's not really personal. This was personal. And I thought it needed to be personal because focus is personal because it's that, I don't like to use the word balance. It's that harmony that you have between work integration, your personal life. And so it's church, you know, everything just integrated together. It's that harmony. So that orchestra, how do we make sure it all sounds good and works well for us in life? And so I talk about it at the front of the book and then everyone I talked to said, nope, you gotta, you gotta have that personal voice. So you, you'll see my kids in there. You'll see my wife in there. Talk about her empty drawer, which is one of the favorite parts of the book. And so looking back, I'm like, so glad I did that, that I was talking from a personal level, marrying that personal up with that institutional research uh, so it's been a it's been a winning combination, which is good, but it's really tricky. It was a big challenge because I hadn't done that before. Yeah, I, I love that empty drawer story. I'm still kind of jury out whether you're both crazy or your wife is just way wiser than both of us here. Uh, that was probably one of the best stories from the book. Um, one thing that stuck out to me from the book is you uh, you talk about spirit animals, and I kind of took it as we sometimes kind of manifest these spirit animals to avoid stepping into our story. And so uh, I, f I found that kind of cute and relatable. So talk to us about spirit animals. Yeah, it's, there's four spirit animals, and you're going to be able to identify with all four, but there's one that I say you major in and one that you minor in. But you'll have tendencies of all four. Most of us do, but it's just you major in one and you minor in another. And I'll love to hear what, I'll put you on the spot and figure out which one you are, what your major is. But we've got, when you look at it, you've, you've got the squirrel, which we talked about at the intro. The squirrel's really good at starting projects. And they're really good in sales. They know the trendiest restaurants are like, boom, 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 boom. So a lot of these, there's positive aspects of these spirit animals, but then they have a tough time completing that project because they look at the next shiny object and go, oh, I want to move on to that thing. And so they move on to that. So a lot of us, that's what we, our spirit animal is a squirrel. 
Then the other one's a hedgehog. Um, and I kind of minor in this a little bit. When you look at a hedgehog, they curl up in a ball when they feel like there's fear out there. There's some, some predator. And what that looks like in the modern world is that you might procrastinate or procrastinate. Most people don't know about procrastination, but procrastination is you're answering email, you're working, but you're not really working on the big thing. You're doing the busy stuff. You're just nailing it because you're, you're worried or you don't complete a project. So sometimes I wrestle with this where I, I'm like done with the book, basically, except for that last sentence for months. And it's like, why don't I push it out there? Because I'm afraid it might fail. Like I'm afraid that no one's going to like the book. And so that's what hedgehogs do and look at that. Chameleons, they're great people. They're like they're people pleasers, which is great. Like you think about thousands of years, you assimilate to the tribe, you're putting others first. The issue becomes with the chameleon is when they're in a job because they think, oh, my parents would like me to be in that job. Or I'm doing this and they confuse it and say, oh, once I get through this season, then I'll do the big thing. And then that season never comes, right? It's never going to be like, here's your swath of empty time to attack that big thing. And so that's what chameleons wrestle with, is they're basically put others first, people pleasers, but they take it to the extreme. And then last but not least, if you look at it, you've got the army ant. And this is what I major in. So the army ant is, the army ant can carry 5,000 times their weight. I don't know if you know this, but an army ant can carry 5,000 times their weight, but that doesn't mean they should. Because they get back to the anthill and they can't get all that stuff into the anthill. And what it looks like in the modern world is that you start parallel processing things a lot at once. And so for instance, in my case, I might say, oh, I want to, I want to write this book and I want to produce this video and I want to do this podcast and I want to do this, the blah, 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 blah. And then you parallel process those things and it takes you five times longer than it would be if you attacked one at a time systematically and the quality dramatically improves when you do that, you're happier and also healthier. And so that's what an army ant does. They take on too many things at once and they'd be better off doing one thing at a time. Well, I would say I am a squirrel army ant and so sometimes I feel like being the squirrel is a superpower in terms of like enthusiasm and getting other people excited. But what I've learned with that as a tendency is I have to be diligent to, to knock things out fast and like strike getting things in, into a momentum and maybe a delegation phase while I'm still super excited about something. Because otherwise, you know, there's like 70 other shiny nuts up in the tree that I'm really excited about in the next 24 hours. So yeah, squirrel army ant. I'm not sure if that's the best or worst combination, but I, th those are the two that really connected with me. Yeah, no, that's good. You're the inverse that I am. And so we're, we're very related. But again, we kind of relate to all four of those, to be honest. Yeah, I can certainly see I have different seasons uh, of the year where I will or, you know, depending on the projects where I might fall into a different category temporarily. So, yes, the, an important part of reading this book, going on your focus project journey is discovering your spirit animal so you can figure out how to effectively deal uh, with those tendencies uh, in terms of like your journey. So obviously you're writing a book, you're going on a, a, a personal journey to make changes. Like, how did you decide what to focus on first? Why was it, uh, you know, one issue or, or one thing to focus on a month, you know, dedicating two hours of time a day, having like a top 10 list of things to knock out? Like, how did you come up with sort of the framework or the methodology for the journey you're going to go on? Yeah, I got excited before I wrote the book. I go, what? Basically, I got super excited to say, what would a month look like if I just spent time organizing the house? Like something like that, where you, everyone listening is getting excited about that right now, I bet. A lot of them. Just like, oh my gosh, I've been thinking about doing X, Y, and Z, but what if my focus was just on organizing the house? And then I kind of had to step back from that and go, okay, realistically, A, I'm not going to have the time to do that. But B, is that everyone reading this book isn't going to have time to do that. So let's get realistic on what time allocation we can put to this. And so it's like, whatever that time allocation might be for you, whether it's a half hour, an hour, two hours, is start with that. And then also figure out what's the first thing you should attack is the best question to ask yourself is, what's the one thing if I do it well, makes everything else either easier or unnecessary. Now for me, when I'm doing this for 12 months, I had to look at what's that first month. I could not do the project unless we made sure that our sales were okay and solid. And so I called it growth because whatever you do, basically all of us are in sales, no matter what you do. If you're trying to get your kid to eat green beans, you're in sales. Uh, meanwhile, kids are really good at sales, right? They're like, daddy, daddy, I want some ice cream. It's like, no, no, no. And then guess what? Katya's is eating ice cream, licking ice cream like 20, 20 minutes later. And so no matter if you're at a PTA meeting, 
you know, or a church. If you're going to church, you want to raise money for church. We're kind of, we're all in sales at the end of the day. And we're trying to get folks to do something or move to, in some direction. So for me, that was growth. And that was primarily getting me to speak on stage. That's our primary revenue driver. And it was crazy when we did this. So first of all, for a year, I messed up five times. Because I go, okay, I'm going to do an hour a day or two hours a day. And then I'd track it. And at the end of the month, 17 minutes, not per day, 17 minutes total. Because I was letting all these things pull at me. I was focused on the urgent rather than the important. And so once I finally got it right on the fifth try, mind blowing, because it could have been that didn't work. And then there's no book. But all of a sudden, we had a record amount of sales for that month, not only that month, but we actually did a year worth of sales in that month, just by targeting two hours a day to where I was like focused on only sales in those two hours. And so whatever that thing is for you, whatever that growth piece, just ask yourself, what's the one thing if I do it well, makes everything else either easier or necessary. I'm calling it sales, but it's basically getting me on stage is the most important thing for us in that year that I did this. And so just that power of focus, it showed me, wow, you take that magnifying glass and you take that power of that sun and put it on one spot, it burns a hole. If you're just waving that magnifying glass around, it's not going to do anything. And in, uh, in terms of the the 12 month journey, I guess uh, I would say contrast for us, uh, which month was the most challenging and then which month was the the most fulfilling or had the the biggest impact? I always like, like, give me your best and your worst. Yeah. The, the hardest for me, so I always like to start with the bad news first because then you get your dessert. Like my kids, when they're eating, I go, why are you eating like the good stuff first? Don't you want to say that for last? They're like, no, 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 I'm eating the good stuff first. I go, I love it. I love kids. I'm like, well, when I was a kid, I always saved the best for last. But so the, the, the one I struggled with the most was the mindfulness because like a lot of us, I'll sit there and try to carve out, here's 20 minutes. I'm going to lay down on a yoga mat. I'm going to turn on some nice calming music maybe some trickles in the background of some water and meditate. And I'd always, one, I always think I didn't have time for that. And two, I mean, life happens, right? And so that was a learning is that you got to strive for progress, not perfection. So this is before the pandemic. So I was flying a ton. So I learned just, in, and I learned this a little bit from Arianna Huffington. I learned to meditate on the plane. It's not ideal, but it's better than zero. And so and it helped me even during the delay. I'm like, cool, just flipping that mindset, like judo flip. It wasn't always rainbows and unicorns, but I'd say, great, we're delayed, more time to meditate here while I sit in the seat, this middle seat, uh, and then go from there. So that was the hardest one for me, just because it's tough for me, like a lot of us to turn our brains off. And so, but I, I got better at it. And that month also was journaling. Journaling's so powerful and I'm so much better at it, but I'm not even close to some of the best at it. And so I just realized, okay, one sentence is good enough. So just trying to do that. So we're just, it's a little bit. And then some days when you have the time to write for that 20 minutes and you got a full page, great. But it's really about just doing that, that one sentence. And so that was the hardest month for me, that mindfulness. The most rewarding was family. Just what I dedicated time was cognizant. Okay, this is what we're going to do around the family. And so whether that's writing notes, whether that's just little notes to the kids, but just being, that was the most fulfilling uh, for me. Yeah, I find with the the family piece that you know when our kids uh, at you know, just random times are like, "Daddy, can you this?" and you're like, "Oh, I've been way way too much ignoring you." You know, when kids when your kids start asking for silly things that should just be stuff you're doing already, I always find like that's like my uh, thermometer for dad's not spending enough time paying attention to you guys. Um, and, and I like what you shared about mindfulness. Um, I interviewed Kamal Ravikant last year about his book, "Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends on It." And one of the things he said in terms of his mindfulness practice, he'd put on headphones and, and in the back of an Uber and, and just meditate or wherever he could find the time. So, you know, I think one of the, the hardest things, like, like you said, on the one hand, turning your mind off, but, but also giving your permission to find that mindfulness time where you have the time and the space to do it. It doesn't have to be this pristine, super complex uh, arrangement. It could be anywhere. It could be on a plane, in an Uber, in your office when you just have the time to do it. But um, I always find, especially being mindful every day, like I, I get up for 4.30 and go for a three-mile walk, listen to a podcast, uh, pray, what, whatever it might be, and just that head-clearing time in the beginning of the day, that, that's when it works best for me. 
But when I travel um, and things are, especially last year, you couldn't even go work out or anything at a hotel. Um, trying to be mindful on the road looked very different uh, last year. So definitely seizing the moment wherever uh, it can be found. Um, one of the things I thought that was interesting uh, in terms of the process is you evaluated yourself. So at the end of the month, you gave yourself a grade. Um, wh- why did you add that component? Uh, you know, to uh, to see when when you how well you were doing, and then uh, related to that, um, how did you keep track of your progress or your grades throughout the month? Obviously, you're writing a book, so there's an incentive to keep track. But you know, maybe you know if if somebody's not writing a book in this process, how why would they keep track of that? Yeah, no, it's a it's a good question. So at the end of each chapter, I gave a chapter summary because I like to write a book like I'd like to read it. So in the book, you can actually flip it. You don't have to read it to A to Z because obviously a lot of us are busy. And so and a lot of people that are getting the focus book, I say, if you're too busy to read this, you need to read it. And But you can flip to any page and it'll make sense. But at the end of each chapter, I put in a summary, one page summary of what I learned and what you should take away from, from that month and that chapter and then I'd grade myself like a school, like a kindergarten, like A, B, C, D. And I only got two A's um, throughout it. But I, I did that because I wanted to show, too, that you don't have to be perfect at this stuff. It's about leading to progress. And I think it's the best way to learn is, like, where did I do well and where did I falter? Um, so you go back and maybe say, okay, I'm just not good with that stuff. And that's okay. I'm not going to try to focus on it. So make it not a liability. Other places that are super important, let's say I got like a C on family. I'm like, okay, that's really important to me. We got to get that up to an A. So let's figure out what's going on there. And so that's why I gave myself a grade at the end of each chapter. Um, Just one, to make sure that people understood that it's not about perfection, it's about progress. And then also two, I think that's the greatest way to learn. Where do we do well? Where can we do better? And do we need to do better? Like you might say, yep, I'm just not good at that. Don't like it. It's not a liability. I'm not focused on that. Let's focus on this other stuff. When you had mentioned uh, during your mindfulness month, you uh, were keeping in journal, a journal in terms of tools, apps, resources, additional things that could be helpful for our own focus project journey. Anything you would recommend we have ready uh, by our side in addition to the book? I mean, I try to keep things simple and I don't talk about this in the book, but something that I'm doing now that came out of the book is that just on a spreadsheet. So you can use paper or I just like to use Google free spreadsheet. I just have the date and then I rate how the day was. Is it a plus three? Is it a plus two? Plus one, minus one? Because I don't, it's never neutral. Minus one, minus two or minus three. And that's helpful because throughout the day you can check in and go, oh, wow, it's, I'm on my way to a negative two right now. How can, how can I flip this to at least get to a negative one or get to a positive one? And so trying to track that over time is very helpful because that relates to focus. Usually if you're focused on what you want to be doing, you're going to be in the, the one, two, a three is like crazy. I really give myself a three. It's like if you had a baby, if you launch the book or the book becomes a number one bestseller, whatever that might be, you know, your daughter does well on X, Y, Z that she's trying to do well on. Do you feel great as a dad? So the threes are very few and far between. Unfortunately, the negative threes are very few and far between, but that's an easy way to track stuff as well. It's a simple tool. It's a free tool to do that each and a day. But the most important thing is it allows you to check in with yourself. How do I feel? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? And should it be what I'm doing right now? Uh, obviously, the Focus Project journey, it's set up to run out over the course of a year. Um, how does it look to continue doing this sort of a thing in year two and year three? I'm curious for you, have you continued this practice? Like, what does your life look like on this side of the Focus journey? journey? Or focus project journey. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd like to say I'm perfect at doing this stuff, but I'm far, far from it, but I've gotten better at it. Um, and I'll get in a second, the three things I learned from writing the book and also the project itself. But I think for all you listeners out there, one, if you're so inclined to get the book, thank you so much. You don't have to go on the, on a project yourself. I, I encourage you to do it. Um, and maybe that project might not be for a month. It might just be for that day. Like just right now, what's the one thing I need to do that makes everything else easier and necessary today. And so that's a habit that I've carried over. It's something that I do uh, each and every day is make sure I'm focused on the big versus the busy. And I'm better at realizing when the busy is happening, when those urgencies are pulling at me. I'm not, and I'm not always great at resisting them, but at least I'm aware of them. And with that awareness, you get better at resisting them. 
Um, and so the three things I learned from the book, one, focus is very, very, very hard, especially in this unfocused world, but it can be learned, it can become a habit. And that goes into number two, which is that successful people are better at focus than all of us. And it's not something they were born with, and it's not something that they went to school to get. It's just they've put into processes and systems in place to help them. And that main system is they say no more than we do. And so it's getting a process to be able to say your yeses should be emphatic yeses and your no's should be emphatic no's, but sugarcoated, I say. And so an emphatic yes means you want two Super Bowl tickets? Yes. If it's, hey, do you want to come do this? And you're like, ah, I should probably do that. That should be a no. Like if it's just like, yeah, I should probably do that. Those should be no's. And so by being emphatic, yes, you have more yeses in the future. And a process for saying no, like this, this is just what, what I use, is I go, ah, oh, this is a great opportunity, but it's not for me. I'm heads down, I'm writing a book right now and I've got to get that out. Whatever that is that you're doing. And so that, that helps the other person too. That was a learning, but I won't get into that because we got shortness of time. But that's the second thing is that really yeses are yeses, noes are noes. And then third, which we've talked about at length, is that it's not about perfection, it's about progress. Well, and anytime I get to talk to somebody who is a fellow podcaster, uh, I like to give people kind of a preview of what they can expect. So if my listeners head on over to Spotify and Apple Podcasts and subscribe to your Super You podcast, what are they going to encounter there? The whole podcast Super You is designed to unlock and unleash your inner superpower. It's a podcast that I knew would have a listening audience of one because I was exercising, whether it was outside or at the gym. And I go, you know what I really want to know? I want to know seven tips from Warren Buffett. I want to know seven tips from Andy Stanley. I want to know seven tips from Ariana Huffington. You name it, Oprah, down the line. And so if you come to Super U, we do guest interviews. We also provide seven super tips. But primarily, the whole podcast is designed to unlock and unleash your inner superpower. And so if you check it out, hopefully it helps you do that. And for the listeners, the viewers who'd like to connect with you, find out more about your books, uh, your animation company, your podcast, where can we discover you on the web? I'm Equal Man across the board. So equalman.com and uh, Equal Man all social. Even all my email addresses are equalman at equalman.com. So feel free to reach out if we can help entertain, educate, empower you. We'd love to do it. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Eric and pick up your very own copy of his various books and resources. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Eric Wallman. Once again, our book today was The Focus Project, The Not-So-Simple Art of Doing Less. And again, if you want to connect with Eric, a great place to start is his website. You can find that over at equalman.com. And Eric, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Sean.